again. Today we are going to talk about the second in our series about prevention and control. We're going to talk about antiviral drugs. As we talked about last time, you can prevent being infected if you are vaccinated. But with one exception, a vaccine won't work if you're already infected. Do you remember the exception? Rabies is the exception. We can still vaccinate and protect you after you've been bitten by a rabid animal because, as I said, it takes so long for the virus to reach the CNS. But if you're not vaccinated or if there's no vaccine available, we do have some antivirals that can interfere with an infection once it has started. We have been working on antivirals since 1963, over 50 years, but we have very few, less than 100 antiviral drugs. And their development is shown on this timeline where we have the first antiviral in 1963, idoxuridine. And this graph is nice because it shows you the different viruses. I mean, these are the ones that we have antiviral drugs against. They're shown all on this graph, HIV, hepatitis C, herpes simplex, influenza, hepatitis B virus, varicella zoster, human cytal, megalovirus, respiratory syncytial virus, and human papillomavirus. Here's a question, which are the two acute infections on this graph? Influenza, one, what's the other? I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if you didn't know because we haven't even mentioned it. The other one is respiratory syncytial virus. That's a acute respiratory infection, mainly of babies. Zero to six months of age is the prime time for getting infected. So for that reason, we have developed an antiviral. But all the others are persistent infections. And the, the lines show you the development of antivirals for these viruses. You can see HIV discovered 1983, boom, huge increase in the number of HIV antivirals. That's the red line. We now have 41. We have 18 hep C drugs, big increase just in the last 10 years or so. And all the others are rising relatively slowly. Two things you could get from this. One, there's not a lot of antivirals and it takes a long time to get them. And two, they're mostly against persistent virus infections. These are all the approved antiviral drugs from the 50s to 2016. And it tells you for retroviruses, and of course they're all against HIV on the top here. And we'll talk about some of these today. These are in the middle against DNA viruses. We have papilloma, hep B, and then uh, herpes viruses. And then on the bottom, some RNA viruses. Uh, flu, RSV, and then hep C. A lot of hep C drugs now. The question is, why are there so few antiviral drugs? And one of the reasons is that because viruses need cells in which to replicate, right? They're obligate intracellular parasites. There's always an overlap. And so it's hard to find drugs that are unique to a virus and have no effect on any host cell protein. You know, if you target a viral polymerase, we have our own polymerases, nucleic acid polymerases, and they're going to be similar. And so it's hard to get a drug that doesn't have side effects. A side effect arises when, besides targeting a, drug, a viral protein, the drug also hits a cell protein. So that's one reason. And another reason that they're hard to make is that a lot of viruses, for, for many years, we couldn't grow hep B or, hep, or uh, human papillomaviruses in cell culture, so that hinders. Sometimes there's no animal model for virus infection. The FDA has a two animal model rule. They want to see efficacy in two animal models before they will approve a drug for people. So the animal doesn't include people. And so it's hard to find that. And in fact, smallpox, there are two drugs that have been stockpiled uh, by the US in case of um, bioterrorism using smallpox. And there's, I don't believe they're yet FDA approved because there is only one animal model that they've been tested in. And then of course, some viruses are really dangerous to work with and you have to, if you wanna work with a virus, 
You have to work under BSL-4 conditions, which means the, the highest biological condition we can think of where not only is the building isolated, but everyone has to wear spacesuits with air supplies and so forth. So that makes it hard. Now you can certainly, now we know how to do experiments with individual proteins. We can produce proteins and look for inhibitors, but eventually you have to find out if they block virus replication. And so if the virus is dangerous and it can only be worked on in a BSL-4, that limits the amount that can be done, which is not to say that we don't make antivirals for these dangerous viruses, but, but they're fewer than uh, with other viruses. But there is a third region which I think is really the most, the best explanation for why we have so few drugs is that an antiviral drug has to completely inhibit virus replication. You can't have 90% inhibition or 80% inhibition. It has to be complete because if it's not, you will get mutants that are resistant to the drug very easily. Now, if you think about it, our standard pharmaceuticals, anything that you take that inhibits a target in you, if you have a headache or a steroid or any other pharmaceutical that you get a prescription for, it doesn't have to be 100%. But antivirals have to inhibit 100%, otherwise you will select for virus mutants. So you can find lots of inhibitory drugs, but most of them are not potent enough, so you have to throw them away. That raises the cost, and it takes longer to develop the drugs. So here's an illustration of this. We have on the y-axis the virus level, and on the x-axis time, and we're giving drug to an, an experimental animal, say, at three different doses, a low dose, an intermediate, and an optimal dose. And you can see the optimal dose completely inhibits virus replication but the intermediate and low doses do not. And in fact, eventually virus re replication rebounds, most likely because we're selecting for resistant mutants. So you have to have an optimal dose, and if your viral, antiviral is not 100%, you will never get there. Another problem which I've mentioned before, and which we'll now put in context, is that many acute infections are short. And that's why most of the antivirals are mostly against persistent infections where you have plenty of time. You have the life of the host to get a diagnosis, to get a prescription and fill it and start taking it. There's plenty of time. But if you have a rhinovirus infection which is over in three or four days, that is very hard to get your drug for, to get diagnosed and pick up your prescription and then take it. By then your, your cold is almost over. We don't have broad spectrum antivirals. So you could say, well, if you have flu-like symptoms, just give someone an antiviral. If you have a bacterial infection, you're typically first given a broad spectrum antimicrobial. And then if they isolate bacteria from you, they can see what specifically inhibits it. And then they will switch you to a more specific antimicrobial. It's just better. And, in terms of getting rid of your infection and also not wiping out other things in you, other microbes in you. But we don't have that for viruses. We don't have broad spectrum antivirals. Whether or not we'll ever have one is a good question. I'll talk about that later today, but that makes it difficult to deal with these very quick infections that are hard to diagnose. It's kind of a chicken egg situation. Companies don't wanna make antivirals because there aren't rapid diagnostics and no one wants to make rapid diagnostics because there are no antivirals. So once the two come together, then we may see more. And finally, you may say, well, why don't we in the winter just take anti-influenza drugs all the time? You know, there is one exception. We do that for at-risk people for HIV infection. There's pre-exposure prophylaxis that we recommend, but it's not a good idea to give healthy people drugs that they don't need, because all drugs have side effects. Indeed, the drugs used for PrEP, for HIV PrEP, have side effects. So that's why most of the antivirals are against persistent infections. There's this roadblock with uh, acute infections that could proceed rapidly. And as I said, someday if we have at-home diagnostic mirrors, that'll tell you every morning what you have and transmit a prescription, then we may get to the point where there are antivirals for acute infections. Let's take a look at the history of antiviral development and see what it was like over the years and where it is today, just to put it in perspective. The early 1950s, people started looking for antiviral drugs. 
which is relatively recently when you think about it. I mean, we knew about viruses since uh, the early 1900s. And the reason this was done, because there was, of course, precedent for antibiotics that inhibit bacteria. Penicillin and others led the way. The sulfa drugs, the sulfonamide antibiotics, which you, you may call sulfa drugs, were some of the first uh, antimicrobials discovered. And chemists said, well, can we derivatize these and get them to inhibit viruses? Uh, eventually, that led to the synthesis of these thiosemicarbazones. Those are chemicals based on this structure at the right here with various side groups. They were found to be active against pox viruses, and after, even after World War II, smallpox was still a big problem globally. We didn't eradicate it until 1979. But then in the 60s and 70s, companies began what we call blind screening programs, which means you just take lots and lots of different chemicals and you see which ones have antiviral activity. If you find some, then you can modify them chemically and make them more specific and more potent and have less side effects and so forth. So these were the early days of antiviral research. And in blind screening, what you do is Companies have lots of chemicals stored on their shelves that they've made over the years. They have these chemical libraries, thousands and thousands of chemicals. And you can take those and just go through them one by one and see if they inhibit whatever virus you're looking for. What people also did was to look for natural products. Take some dirt and culture it and see if something grows that will inhibit your virus. My wife used to work at Merck and when we went on vacation, she would carry these bags and a GPS, and we, she would take dirt samples wherever we went, get the GPS coordinates, and then bring it back to Merck, and they would see if there's anything in it. Why the GPS coordinates? Well, if they got something, they want to be able to go back and get more of it. So random chemicals, natural products of different sorts, and you just see if it's something is in there that inhibits your virus. Of course, the dirt, you're growing up bacteria or fungi that are making something. You then have to purify it, identify it, and then see if you can modify it chemically. So you get leads from these screens. You can, the chemists can modify them to reduce toxicity, et cetera, improve a variety of properties. So that's called blind screening because you're just starting with inhibition of virus replication. You're not actually targeting a specific stage of the replication cycle. And many, many molecules were made. Uh, but one of the first that was discovered is this one here called Symmetrel or amantadine. The structure of it shown on the right there. That was approved in the 1960s for influenza A viruses. And today it's one of three drugs, three or four drugs that we use. Although most isolates are now resistant to it. The mechanism of action when it was first licensed was not known, and it wasn't until many years later, uh, in the 1990s, that we sorted it out. We're gonna come back to this and understand. So again, remember, this was identified as inhibiting influenza virus replication, and it was licensed without knowing the mode of action, which uh, is not something we do any longer. Today, antiviral drug discovery is a robust industry. Many companies are doing this. Because, as you know, we have lots of chronic viral infections, persistent viral infections out there. Uh, and we use different technology. We can do recombinant DNA technology and clone a gene encoding a virus protein that we want to target, a polymerase or an enzyme of some sort. Chemistry is much more sophisticated, so you can actually synthesize libraries of different compounds that may inhibit your virus. We know the replication cycles of most viruses. We know what genes are in the genome. We can make proteins in different organisms. And even if you can't grow the virus, you could make an antiviral, although it would be very difficult to get it licensed. And we don't do blind screening anymore. We, we zoom in on a specific part of the replication cycle. And of course, you all know that viruses go through a series of events, starting from attachment to cells. And each of these steps are targets for looking for inhibitors entry, uncoding, mRNA synthesis, protein synthesis. DNA and RNA replication is a big one because many viruses encode their own polymerases. 
So that is different from the host cell. And then, of course, assembly. And we'll go through some examples of these as we go through uh, the different viruses. So you pick for your virus what you think might be a good target. And you, might, and you do have information which suggests that one target might be better than another. Or if you don't, you turn to something where there aren't so many antivirals already, and you try and discover something novel. So in the field of HIV, the inhibitors for uh, reverse transcription and proteases were saturated, and people started to say, well, what about integration? Can we find inhibitors of that as well? The path of drug discovery is difficult. We start with a medical need, which I mentioned before. You have to have an infection that causes a number of infections. I don't know what the number is, but it has to be something above just a few hundred. Typically, well, let's take Ebola virus. You know, before the last outbreak, the outbreaks were around 1,000 maximum people in each outbreak. There were 25 previous outbreaks. Of course, the one in 2015 in Western Africa, there were 25,000 cases the first time it ever went that high. Nevertheless, even with those thousands of cases every now and then, uh, uh, there was a medical need to develop antivirals. Then you have to find out what you're going to inhibit. Am I going to inhibit a, a certain step in the life cycle, a particular gene? If you say, well, this gene looks interesting, let's inhibit it. First, you have to do a proof of principle, which means take out the gene and show that it's essential. Mutate it or take it out of the viral genome. Because what if you picked a target and you started doing antiviral drug discovery, but then someone publishes a paper saying this gene is not necessary for viral replication? That would be bad, right? So you have to make sure you do that first. All right, so you now have a gene that you're going to target. You may have some structure information that will guide you. Then you take your libraries of compounds or natural products. Nowadays, RNAi can be part of it as well. And you develop some kind of a screen. And we're going to talk in a moment of what sorts of screens you can do. You can also do in silico screens, which means, say, you have a structure of a protein, a three-dimensional stru structure. You can then dock compounds into it computationally and get an idea of what sort of compound would be a good fit for an enzyme active site or some other part of a protein. That's what we mean by in silico. And then you start to get hits, which means compounds that inhibit your target. You can then modify it, eventually proceed through drug candidates and clinical testing. And these modifications to the compound, you want to know, will it get to the right place at the right concentration? So many drugs you take orally, but the viruses may not be in your digestive tract. They may be in the blood, in different organs. So you have to make sure the compound gets there to where it needs to be. That's called bioavailability. You have to make sure it lasts long enough. Pharmacokinetics. You know, if your drug lasts 10 minutes in the blood, it's not going to be good. People will have to take it way too often. So you use animal models to answer these questions. And will it be safe, of course? Animal models. Sometimes. Compounds kill cells immediately when you try and assay them for antiviral activity. Most people will throw those away and not bother to go into animals. So you do a lot of work in animals before proceeding to clinical testing. And even then, many drugs fail in humans because animals are models and they don't predict what's going to happen in people. And so the costs are high for developing drugs because there are these, all these steps where you make your compounds. And here we're looking on the y-axis, numbers of compounds. Let's say we're going to search through 100,000 compounds. And at each step, we're going to reject a lot of them. It takes time to do all of that. Antiviral effect. Many compounds don't have antiviral effect in cells. They're toxic. They don't have an antiviral effect in animals. They're toxic in animals. And then you proceed into human trials. Typically, you don't put lots of candidates in people. You end up with one after all the animal testing, and you test it one at a time. And eventually you get approval. Maybe it takes 10 to 15 years, millions of dollars. With the onset of HIV and AIDS, the FDA was forced to fast track the development of many antivirals and not take the usual amount of time. And that's really resulted in rapid turnaround in the licensing process. But you have to acquire what we call preclinical data, and it's on this slide. So you discover your compound and show it inhibits what you want. You have to accumulate these data which show it inhibits 
replication in cell culture. It inhibits in two animal models. It's not toxic. And then you apply to the FDA for an IND, which is an investigational new drug. And then you can start doing clinical trials, which occur in phases. Phase one typically is a safety trial. Make sure you take 10 or 20 or 30 people, you give them the drug, make sure there are no side effects. And then you can do efficacy and dosing trials in phase two and three to make sure it is efficacious. So for an antiviral, you may want to see uh, in, a, in an at-risk population, what dose is protective in a phase two, and in phase three, a larger study to look at very more people. And of course, if you're doing this in different populations, you have to make sure your drug works in those different age groups. You have to test it in whatever age group you want to target. If you want to test your antiviral in six-month-old babies, you have to test it in them. You cannot use a 60-year-old to test the drug for a six-month-old. The same thing in, in geography. If you want to use a drug in a certain area, you have to test to make sure it works there uh, because everyone is different, of course. And after all these phases, which take many years, you submit your data to the FDA, and if they approve it, then you put it into uh, on the market. And of course, there's ongoing safety to make sure nothing happens. Remember, you can't do all of these tests in more than a few thousand people, but your drug may end up in millions of people. And there, very rare side effects may come up that you never saw before, so you have to have ongoing surveillance. So it's a really arduous process. It costs a lot of money. And you know, online, people are always saying that big pharma just wants to make money, and they charge a lot for their products. The, re the reason they charge a lot is it takes a long time and a lot of money to develop them. There's a lot of failure in the meantime. Um, I don't mean to defend them unilaterally, because they do make some mistakes. And you've heard bad stories about companies that charge a lot for what shouldn't be charged a lot. But this is an arduous process that takes a long time. Let's talk about a couple of different kinds of screens you could develop. The key is to be clever and do something that can be automated and you can get the results rapidly. And we call these mechanism-based screens. Here we're looking for an inhibitor of a protease. So let's say we've identified a viral protease. It's essential for virus replication. We want to find an inhibitor. We're going to screen through lots of compounds. So we make a high throughput screen where we take a little substrate which has a cleavage site for the protease. And uh, on one end of this peptide, you put a bead so you can separate out the cleaved from the uncleaved. And on the other side, you put a, a fluorophore, which you can measure. And so we're measuring fluorescence intensity here of the soluble peptide. If the protease cleaves it, it'll release the fluorophore from the, the bead, which is insoluble. And you can measure the generation of fluorescence with time here. These are times and seconds with fluorescence intensity. And then you can screen through inhibitors, which would block the production of fluorescence in the supernate. So this can be automated and done. You could screen thousands, tens of thousands of compounds with this kind of an assay. So it's not just adding virus and drug to cells and doing a plaque assay anymore. It's really a very specific assay. Here's another cool one. This is a cell-based screen where we're using E. coli to look for an antiviral. And what we're using is this tetracycline resistant pump. So this is the wall of a bacterium, and in it is a uh, multi-pass membrane protein that makes bacteria resistant to tetracycline because this pumps it out. As soon as it gets in the cell, this pumps it out so it can't have an effect. And what you can do here, if you put this resistance gene into bacteria, it makes them resistant to uh, tetracycline, as I said. You can engineer a viral protease site into one of these inside loops, which others have shown to be essential for pumping out tetracycline. And so now, if you express the HIV protease in these bacteria, it will cleave this pump, that specific loop, and it will inactivate it. So these cells will be now sensitive to tetracycline. So here, the HIV protease has cleaved that loop, no colonies on a plate, you just played out E. coli with, with the protease in it. And now if you have an inhibitor of the protease, which is shown by this red blob inserting into Pac-Man there, you can no longer cleave the efflux 
protein, now the bacteria were gross. So you would do an assay looking for colony growth, basically. You screen that, lots and lots of compounds, and then if some bacteria are growing, then you take that compound and go further. So what we do, we do high throughput screening, many compounds a day, 10,000 compounds a day, cranking through chemical libraries, again, libraries that the companies have. Here's another story from my pharmaceutical uh, Merck wife. One, one year, they decided to look through their entire chemical collection for some, I don't remember what they were looking for, it wasn't a viral, antiviral, but uh, they made everybody take a day a week and weigh out their chemical library because they had so many compounds they wouldn't have been able to do it with just 10 people. They had to use the thousands of people at the site and they rotated them out. So you go in and you weigh out 10 milligrams, put it in a vial, label it, and then someone would screen that. And they did that in order to get through their library. Natural products, the stuff that comes from dirt and the environment. Combinatorial chemistry, the, a way to take Linkers, chemical linkers, these are different chemical compounds that you can add in different combinations to make a whole array of different compounds that you can then test as being uh, antiviral. You can do structure-based design, you can take the three-dimensional structure of a viral protein and as I said, use in silico procedures to try and say what will fit in here. We'll see how this was done with the neuraminidase of influenza virus. If you know a natural ligand, you can try and mimic it with a compound. And also doing screening on your computer as well. This, this whole process has been roboticized. You don't even need people anymore. You have these uh, multi-well plates, the plastic plates with lots of, this one has 1,500 wells in it, 1,536. And robots will add everything to the wells that's needed to do the assay. You know, the, the enzyme, the substrate, it will, the arms will pick up each plate. These are robotic arms that load the uh, material into the plates. Then they put them in an incubator. The incubator will run for a certain period of time. It will assay the reaction directly and pump it out through a computer so that you can sit home and read this results coming out at any day of, uh, of the week, day or night. And then the arms will take them out as well. So everything is roboticized. So you can do lots and lots of screens uh, in a day. And this of course is not just for antivirals, but any kind of drug screening that's done now. You, the key is to try and go through as many compounds as possible. Our first question is, we have many antibiotics, but fewer antivirals. What is the reason for the difference? Robotic screen, screening is slow. There are few serious viral infections. Resistance is a problem. Antivirals must be potent or all of the above. So most of you got D, antivirals must be potent. That's the correct answer. Robotic screening, of course, is not slow. There, are no, there aren't few serious viral infections. There are many. And resistance is a problem, but that's not why there are so few uh, antivirals. We don't know that resistance arises until we make them. The bottleneck is that potency is tough. Getting 100% inhibition is the hard part. So that brings us to resistance, which you should assume will happen with any drug, any antiviral drug. Resistance will always arise because viruses replicate really well. They make lots of progeny, billions and billions. And even if they have a low mutation frequency in, the, in a huge population, there'll be a virus resistant to whatever antiviral you have. And this is a problem when we have chronic or persistent viral infections where people are infected for life. HIV in particular, you have to take antiviral drugs your entire life because it doesn't cure your infection. If you stop them, the proviral DNA that's integrated into your CD4 positive cells will start to replicate. So extended therapy is an issue. We have, of all those 100 antivirals, that I showed you earlier, we have resistance to every one of them. And if we keep making them at the same rate, we already have resistance out there to all those antivirals. So that's kind of frightening. Of course, it's even worse with antimicrobials, but that's not the topic of uh, this course. So resistance is a real issue, and we have to figure out ways to get around it. Why, why is resistance a problem? Of course, if a patient has a virus infection and becomes resistant, which means the viruses have evolved to be resistant to the drug. You can't treat them anymore. And if there are no other drugs available, it's a death sentence, depending on the virus. 
But the good news is that you can look at the resistance that has arisen. You could identify the mutation, and maybe it will give you insight into developing different drugs, which may not lead to the same problem. So let's talk about the mechanisms of drug resistance in RNA and DNA viruses. So both DNA and RNA viruses have error-prone polymerases. In fact, we have error-prone polymerases, but B DNA polymerases have correction mechanisms, which you learned a long time ago, I'm sure. Uh, DNA polymerases make mistakes, but they can be removed, they can be detected, re excised, and fixed. RNA polymerases do not have proofreading mechanisms. That's an important concept to remember. They cannot correct the mistakes that they make. And RNA virus polymerases make a mistake every 10,000 to 100,000 nucleotides that are polymerized, which is about a million times higher than the DNA mutation rate in our genomes. So in a, in a 10 KB viral genome, that frequency can lead to a mutation in every genome, essentially. Every time a genome replicates, the copy has at least one mutation. And that's a lot. And that gives, that's why we have resistance, because those mutations arise frequently. DNA viruses, as I said, can excise and replace misincorporated nucleotides. Here is a picture of a polymerase copying a single strand, three prime hydroxyl there. New bases are gonna be added to that. And the red part is the new synthesis. And you can see there's a mismatch here, which happens with DNA polymerases as well as RNA polymerases. But then that mismatch can be detected. There are proteins in the cell that will look and make sure there are no mismatches. If there are, there's a machinery that comes in. An exonuclease will chew it away, and then the polymerase will fix it. This mechanism is not present in RNA viruses. That's why they have a substantially higher mutation frequency. That is why. DNA viruses evolve more slowly than RNA viruses because the mutation rate is much lower. Mutation is a main driver of evolution, of everything, not just viruses, but of us as well, and other animals and plants and so forth. But viruses evolve incredibly quickly because of their quick replication rates and their high numbers of progeny. Let's talk about some mechanisms of action of antivirals, so you can understand how they work in, in the different classes. And this is acyclovir, which is a very effective drug for herpes simplex infection. If you get a cold sore and you go to a physician, they will give you a prescription for a derivative of acyclovir. It's highly effective, and you will put it on your, your cold stores as a cream, and it will do the job. Many antiviral drugs are what we call nucleoside and nucleotide analogs. They are derivatives of the four bases shown here, A, G, T, C, and they're modified in a way so that they interrupt DNA synthesis or sometimes they cause lethal mutation. So you can see there are derivatives of each of these four bases with different names. And these are all antiviral compounds. And here is a cyclovir, which is a derivative of guanosine. You can see we have our ribose sugar, the base is at the top, and this hydroxyl is of course key for adding the next base in a growing DNA chain. It's the three prime hydroxyl. And look at acyclovir. You've removed the bottom part of the ribose ring. There's no longer a three prime hydroxyl on which to add bases. So this is a chain terminator. And this is a derivative of acyclovir, gancyclovir. It's got a different modification, which works for other herpes viruses. We call this a prodrug because it needs to be modified before it can be incorporated into DNA by a DNA polymerase. Let's have a look at how that works. Here's the mechanism of action. So you put some acyclovir containing cream on your cold sore. It gets absorbed into cells but it will only be modified by this, the herpes simplex virus enzyme called thymidine kinase to add that first phosphate. That will only happen in herpes simplex virus infected cells. If this drug gets into an uninfected cell, it won't do anything because there is no kinase to add that first phosphate. 
This is not the case with other chain terminators. This is a special one, which makes it very specific for virus-infected cells. Once it has a single phosphate, then there are two cellular kinases that will add the second and the third phosphate onto it. This will get incorporated into growing DNA by the viral polymerase. Remember, it's a guanosine derivative, so it will be put in whenever there is a C, but that will end the growing of the chain because there is no three prime hydroxyl on which to add the next base. See, it's missing. The bottom part of the ring, here's guanosine, the OH is missing. So it's a chain terminator. The polymerase will use it because it looks like G, put it in the growing chain, but then it stops. That's why we call it a chain terminator. So that effectively stops viral DNA replication and you can't get any more virus particles made. Here's an interesting example of how we improved this drug to make it more bioavailable which means getting to the place where it needs to go. Sometimes you treat herpes infections orally. You give someone a pill, and it has to get to the site of wherever the virus is. And acyclovir was not very good at getting to where it needed to be, but chemists found that if you attached a valine, an amino acid, the amino acid valine, onto acyclovir, that makes valacyclovir, which you may get if you ever get an anti-herpes medicine, you, you take it orally, and then it gets to the cells, and inside the cell, the valine is cleaved off by a cellular enzyme. That was found to occur, releasing acyclovir, which can then inhibit viral replication. So the presence of the valine makes it better at going where it needs to go, which of course was determined empirically. Chemists made different derivatives and tested them. So this is an interesting example. And of course, the valine is then taken off so that the OH can be phosphorylated. With the valine on, it won't be active against herpes viruses. But unfortunately, you can get resistance to acyclovir. Now, if you're just treating a cold sore with acyclovir, it's not likely to happen. But let's say you have AIDS and you're getting recurrent herpes infections, which is a real problem, and you're taking acyclovir continuously, you're gonna select for resistance. And these, these arise because even though it's a DNA virus, it's still making mutations. And eventually, if you're on long-term therapy, you're going to select for mutants. There are two kinds of mutations that give rise to acyclovir resistance. One are, are mutants that cannot phosphorylate the prodrug. These are mutations in the viral thymidine kinase gene. Remember, the TK phosphorylates acyclovir, so it can then participate in DNA synthesis. There are mutations in thymidine kinase which make it so it does not recognize the drug. And there are also mutations in the DNA polymerase as well. TK works, it phosphorylates it, becomes a triphosphate, but then the DNA polymerase will not recognize the triphosphorylated acyclovir. This polymerase will still recognize the normal triphosphates, of course, that, that allows the virus to replicate. If you do have acyclovir resistant herpes simplex viruses. As I said, these are a big problem in AIDS patients because the herpes viruses can disseminate. They can go away from their initial sites of blister formation and spread throughout the individual can cause encephalitis. And they are often resistant to uh, other drugs. There are many derivatives that require TK phosphorylation and often these are all resistant at the same time. There is another drug, phoscarnet, that can be used it is, another D, it is a DNA polymerase inhibitor, but there are more side effects. And if the polymerase mutants that are resistant to acyclovir are also uh, resistant to phoscarnate, there's nothing else you can do. And the patient may die of disseminated herpes infection. So this is a real problem, not having enough antivirals. Let's look at mantadine, the, an early inhibitor of influenza virus. Later on, it was shown that this drug interacts with the viral M2 protein, which forms an ion channel. Let's go back to influenza virus entry into cells. The virus binds a receptor taken up by endocytosis. The pH drops in the endosome as the endosome moves towards the nucleus. The low pH, remember, causes fusion catalyzed by the HA molecule so that the genome can get out. pH dropping, of course, it's a function of protons being pumped into the endosome. The M2 protein is embedded in the viral membrane. And that is an ion channel that allows the protons to go into the interior of the particle. 
basically lowers the pH of the interior of the particle, which allows these RNAs to get out. Otherwise, they're stuck in there. The low pH is needed to get the ribonucleoprotein, the viral genome, out of the particle into the cell. So this is inhibited by amantadine. It blocks the protons from getting into the virus particle. It never acidifies, so the RNA cannot get out. And here's a picture of the M2 ion channel in the virus membrane. So here's the inside of the endosome. The protons flow through this channel. It's just a passive channel. The protons are going through it. Amantadine blocks the channel. The amantadine is shown here in red. And it will prevent the protons from getting through so the RNA cannot get out of the particle. So that's, that's how the drug works. And resistance mutations occur uh, by changes in amino acids lining this channel which prevent amantadine from binding. And that, you, that drug has been used so much that there's extensive resistance. Pig farmers found that if they fed it to their pigs, it would grow faster. So they were feeding pounds and pounds to their pigs over the years, and that's selected for many resistant influenza virus mutants. Our next question. Resistance to which antiviral would involve amino acid changes in a viral enzyme? Acyclovir, amantadine, ah, forget C. I didn't tell you about that yet. Penicillin or all of the above. So just consider A, B, D, or E. Most of you got A, acyclovir, which is correct. Acyclovir, what is the viral enzyme called that, well, there are two, right? What are the two enzymes that can change and give resistance to acyclovir? Remember? Thymidine kinase and DNA polymerase, right. Amantadine just hits that channel, which is not an enzyme. There are also inhibitors of the influenza virus neuraminidase. These are more recent developments. And just to remind you, the influenza virus particle is budding here in this image from the cell surface. The virus particle forms, it pinches off, and the neuraminidase functions at this step because normally these viruses that are produced by budding would simply rebind to the same cell because there are proteins with sialic acids on them on the cell surface. So this red Y is a cell protein with sialic acid to which the hemagglutin and combine. So what the neuraminidase does, it clears the surface of sialic acid so that the virus particles can go away. So as the neuraminidase is produced on the cell surface, it removes all sialic acid from the cell. And the sialic acid, remember, is what the hemagglutin and recognizes to bind to, so removing it gets around this problem. Here on the right is the neuraminidase active site. So the structure of the neuraminidase was solved a number of years ago in combination with sialic acid, which is that molecule in the middle there shown in the stick figure. And so from the three-dimensional structure, people started to say, let's predict what kind of chemicals would mimic sialic acid and be inhibitors. And that's how these two neuraminidase inhibitors were designed, purely in silico. And then, of course, they were made and tested. And these are two of them, which are, again, influenza NA inhibitors Zanamivir or Relenza, and also Tamivir or Tamiflu. And again, they're designed to mimic sialic acid. The idea was the closer we can get to sialic acid, to our compound looking like it, the less likely we're going to get resistance, right? Because if it's resistant to a compound that looks exactly like sialic acid, then sialic acid won't bind and that virus will never exist. And so that's how these two were designed. But in fact, they're slightly different, and that's pretty interesting. Again, so they bind in the active site of neuraminidase, they mimic salic acid, and they prevent it from being active because they're stuck in there. So here's how they work. Here on the left is our host cell, and there's a protein, that orange protein has sialic acid in it, and in the virus particle, the neuraminidase is this purple Y, it's binding to the sialic acid. Oseltamivir, or Tamiflu, can bind in the sialic acid binding pocket, but it's slightly different from sialic acid. That's why we've drawn it in a, like a bell shape. Zanamivir, on the other hand, looks almost exactly like sialic acid. So I've drawn it in this triangular fashion. 
We know now that we can get resistance quite readily to Tamiflu. Mutations occur in the viral uh, neuraminidase at these three positions, which are in the sialic acid binding pocket. They exclude the binding of Tamiflu, but they, they still allow sialic acid to bind. So that's because Tamiflu is slightly different from sialic acid. On the other hand, Zanamivir, very difficult to get resistance, but it's much rarer than with Tamiflu because it looks a lot more like sialic acid than does Tamiflu. And here is the latest numbers from uh, what happens every year. Remember, we talked about how the CDC monitors influenza viruses throughout the country. I showed you a graph of the latest season. They also test these viruses for whether they are resistant to different antivirals because then they can tell physicians, don't use this one if this season there's mostly anti antiviral resistant drugs. So we have H1N1, H3N2, and influenza B. So we have Tamiflu here, number of samples tested. You can see 10% are resistant of the H1N1 are resistant to Tamiflu. This year, last year, none of the H3N2, which is good. Uh, Zanamivir, you can see no resistance. That's the one that really looks very close to sialic acid. This one on the right here, Paramivir, is an intravenously administered neuraminidase inhibitor. Many people who get flu are too sick to take these, uh, to take Tamiflu or Relenza. So, so Tamiflu, you take an oral pill. Relenza, you actually have to inhale. So if you're deathly ill, you can't do either one of those. So they developed a um, intravenous formulation. It's a different inhibitor as well. And you can see th there's about 10% resistance. And you could probably predict from that that this looks slightly different from sialic acid. All of these viruses are resistant to the uh, amantadine, that first antiviral I told you about. We, we don't use that anymore. Here's a group of compounds that never got clinical use, but were interesting, first, to, to see how they were developed, and secondly, because they are the drugs that told us how picornaviruses uncoat. These are the wind compounds, initially developed by a company called Sterling Winthrop. That's where the wind comes from. And these are molecules that fit in the pocket, which is at the base of the receptor binding site. So here, to remind you, is our icosahedral viral particle at the top receptor is fitting in and at the base of the receptor binding site is this little pore and these antivirals fit in that pore, they bind very tightly. Remember in the virus particle there's usually a lipid in that pore and when the receptor binds the lipid leaves and that gives the virus flexibility to uncoat. These drugs fit in this pore, they displace the lipid and they're locked in there so they prevent uncoating. So all of our understanding of uncoating has come from analysis of these compounds. Unfortunately, when they've been tested clinically, you get rapid resistance, and so they're not really useful, and none of them have been ever licensed for use. But here is how they were first discovered and modified, and I thought it's a good example of how this is done. Uh, this was the original lead compound, which was discovered, I don't know, in a, in a mixture, at a chemical mixture in the company, and then they proceeded to modify it and you can see how they've modified different, you know, this, this ring at the left has been modified in, in a variety of ways. And in each step, the minimal inhibitory concentration in micrograms per mil of virus replication in cells is measured. So you can see this modification has, has 12. Um, I don't remember, I don't see the original one here. But look, this modification here destroyed it, made it inactive. This one improved it, this one in max. So this is what you're up against. The chemists make different modifications. You test them and you find ones that will in improve the activity. Of course, you also eventually want it to be bioavailable and have stability and so forth. Here's another one on the right here where they have modified the length of the linker between these two moieties on the left and the right. And now we've increased it three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And you can see sometimes with three, it's inactive. Four to seven, it has different levels of activity. Nine, it's inactive again. And then 10, it has some activity. So often, you can't really predict what you're going to get. You just have to try a lot of different combinations. Most, most recently, there have been a lot of new drugs to treat hepatitis 
C virus infections. For many years, there was only one combination therapy you could use, interferon plus a, dr a drug called vibavirin. And it was very toxic, because as I've told you, interferon makes you feel very badly, and a lot of people didn't want to take this, and it wasn't that great, didn't work in everyone. So there was a big effort to make new inhibitors. This is the viral genome at the top here. It's a plus-stranded RNA. And there are a number of enzymes encoded in the genome. There's an RNA polymerase. There's a protease that's responsible for cleaving this polyprotein. And this was one of the first antivirals, an inhibitor of the viral protease. This structure on the lower left is the viral protease. They, did, they solved the structure of the protease with a peptide that binds the active site and can be cleaved by the protease. And then they made derivatives of the peptide, which were inhibitors, and that's what's shown here. If it looks sort of like a polypeptide, that's because it is. It's a few amino acids that have been modified. They represent the original substrate, but it's modified in a way to be inhibitory. So this is one of many antivirals now on the market for hep C. And this is a table showing you the variety we just looked at a protease inhibitor, and there are others as well made by different companies. But there are polymerase inhibitors, both nucleoside and non-nucleoside. A nucleoside inhibitor would be a modified nucleoside that is a chain terminator. A non-nucleoside inhibitor is a drug that binds somewhere else on the polymerase, not at the active site, but causes allosteric effects so that the polymerase is inhibited. And you can see there are combinations. So when these single drugs were first put on the market, resistance was arising too quickly. So the solution is to use two drugs at one time. You can see the various combinations that have been approved here. So that is a solution to avoiding resistance. So now hep C can actually be cured. You can take these drugs long enough. They're very expensive. But if you take them long enough, they will cure the virus because there's no integration, remember. It's the persistent virus infection, so in theory, you can get rid of all the virus in you. How about a broad-spectrum antiviral? Is this possible? Maybe, and I'll tell you some evidence. First, there's this one, LJ001, which was found to inhibit all these viruses. We've got Ebola, Marburg flu, Nipah, Parainfluenza viruses, you can see activity here on the right, all pluses, even vaccinia virus, cowpox virus. But then look here, adenovirus, Coxsackie B, reovirus, negative, negative, negative. What do you think is the target of this antiviral? How do adeno, Coxsackie, and Rio differ from all these other viruses? They don't have envelopes. They don't have a membrane, and this antiviral targets the membrane. All these viruses that are inhibited have an, a lipid membrane around them. And so this, vir this antiviral trashes the virus membrane. So here is VSV incubated with the, the diluent DMSO. You can see the viral particles bullet shaped. Here is a compound, an LJ25, which is not active, and the particles are intact. And here's LJ001, which is the, the chemical structure is there. And the membranes are gone. What are left are the ribonucleoproteins, which are what the arrows are pointing to. So this trashes the membrane. It doesn't hurt cells because the cell membrane is always turning over. So even if this, this drug inserts into a cell membrane, it'll, the cell will simply make more. And it doesn't break up cells. But it breaks up particles because they have one set of membrane, and that's it for them. It's not likely that this will be licensed ever, but it's, an, it's a conceptual uh, idea that you could target a membrane in some way. More recently, there's a drug called favipiravir, and that's what it looks like. It looks like a base, looks like a purine, right? And it's been modified, and it has a fluorine here. This is, turns out to be a broad-spectrum inhibitor of RNA viruses that targets the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. Is they're apparently similar enough that you could make a drug that would hit many viruses. Look at these, plus-stranded West Nile, yellow fever, Zika, uh, Western equine encephalitis, chikungunya, many picornaviruses, noroviruses are all inhibited, minus-strand RNA viruses. Look at them all. Lassa, Ebola, rabies, measles, 
respiratory sense issue, paraflu, really quite remarkable. This is still in testing, but it should ever come to market, then you know, you have, you, it may help a lot in terms of treating people before a specific diagnosis. This is how it works. Here is favipiravir here. It gets into cells, so it gets through the membrane. It's modified by a number of cellular enzymes, so it's triphosphorylated. Of course, that's what would be needed to be taken up into viral RNA by the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. It's thought to act as a chain terminator, which I just showed you for acyclovir. So even though it has a hydroxyl, sometimes the other modifications inhibit the addition of the next base and therefore act as a chain terminator. And so that's one mechanism. But the other is that it seems to cause lethal mutagenesis. So apparently at a fraction of the time, this can be incorporated into the growing RNA. And then at this, when the next strand is copied from it, it mistemplates the other base and you get extensive mutagenesis. We'll come back to that next time when we talk about evolution. Anyway, this is an interesting potential broad spectrum, but it doesn't inhibit DNA viruses because the polymerase is different enough. I would say that's probably the best candidate for a broad spectrum, something that inhibits a polymerase. And as you know, the active site is very similar among DNA and RNA polymerases. So that would be a good target, except our polymerases would probably also be inhibited as well. All right, let's, let's end up with HIV, for which there are inhibitors at every step of the replicative cycle, attachment and entry, fusion, reverse transcription, integration, and maturation at the level of the protease. These inhibitors were made within a few years of the discovery of HIV. And the reason was we had been studying avian and murine RNA tumor viruses for 50 years, right? They didn't cause disease in people, but we learned from that how these viruses replicate all the gene products. So we didn't have to learn that de novo with HIV. It's a reason for studying systems like that. Of course, big issue with AIDS is that the virus continues to replicate for years. The life of the host, the virus is always replicating, so the inhibitors have to deal with that in terms of being potent and also mutagenesis. First HIV drug, AZT, it was actually found in screens for anti-tumor compounds, and they decided to test it against HIV, and it worked. It's phosphorylated by cellular kinases, not by a viral kinase. So right away, you're going to know that it's probably going to have some side effects. It acts as a chain terminator. It's, it's a good substrate for the RT of HIV. Not a great one by cellular polymerases, but it is used, and that's why it has a lot of side effects. So this is AZT. You can see the triazo group here, where there should be a hydroxyl, so that's why it's a chain terminator. This gets phosphorylated by a series of cellular kinases. It's different from herpes, no, no viral kinase. Gets incorporated into the DNA by RT and then acts as a chain terminator. And did you see Dallas Buyers Club? This is a story of AZT. You should see it if you haven't, it's pretty interesting. You know, the, in the beginning there wasn't a lot of AZT to go around, so the patients were not happy, so they shared it. They used to split their pills and they found out that splitting them was enough. The original dose was too high and there were a lot of side effects, but when they split them, it worked. And that actually drove the reformulation uh, of AZT by the FDA. So you can take this orally, one hour half-life. The only reason this was licensed is because there was nothing else. A one hour half-life is terrible in terms of a drug because you have to take it two to three times a day. And of course, if you have to do that, and it makes you feel sick, you're gonna stop taking it. And even if you quit for a day, let me stop for a day so I feel better tomorrow, that encourages viral replication, and what will come up are resistant mutants that have been there, and now they will expand when you stop the drug, and when you take it again, it will have no effect. Within the first year, resistance arose to this, and it was really useless. And the resistance, single amino acid changes at four different sites in reverse transcriptase, and that led to uh, not binding to the phosphorylated drug. So people went back and developed more nucleoside analogs, which are shown here. And eventually someone thought, let's um, 
try combining two of these together, and they did that, and that worked, but still resistance to the two drugs emerged less than a year. So that was a very frustrating in time for anti-HIV therapy. The next step was to develop non-nucleoside RT inhibitors, NNRTIs. They bind away from the active site. A chain terminator, by definition, will bind in the active site because it's going to be incorporated into the growing chain. These bind away from the active site. So in this uh, model of the RT from HIV, the polymerase active site is shown by those stick molecules in blue. And here is the binding site of the NNRTIs away from it. Again, it makes an allosteric change in the enzyme so it no longer works. And these are three of them with names that I cannot pronounce, but at least they're better than the chemical name, which is shown down here. And these, some of these are, are still used in combination therapy, because if you use them by themselves, you get resistance. And in RTI resistance, amino acid substitution in the sites where the drug binds, so they prevent the drug from binding. You can't use them alone. They're used in combination therapy only. Then the next target was the protease which is absolutely required for the production of infectious particles. The protease is part of the gag precursor, that yellow sphere there in the gag pole precursor, just before RT and integrase gets incorporated into the growing particle. It becomes activated once the particle is released and cleaves structural proteins to form the final virus particle. So what people did was to say, well, first, let's solve the structure of the protease and see how the natural substrate, which is a viral protein, how it fits into the protease active site, and then make peptides that have the cleavage site. So this peptide here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight peptide, will fit in the active site and will be cleaved by the protease. And then they made derivatives that look like the peptide that is cleaved, but are modified chemically so that they can't be cleaved. They remain in the active site, and they prevent it from acting on its normal substrate. And here are two sequinavir and darunavir, which are called peptidomimetic. They mimic the natural peptide, but they're chemically modified so they cannot be cleaved, and they sit in the active site and block the activity of the protease. So those Worked for a while, as you might guess, but again, we got resistance. Next target was the integrase. Remember, the integrase is the viral protein. It's shown in this diagram at the right, which allows the retroviral double-stranded DNA to integrate into host DNA. The integrase nicks the target DNA, ligates the host DNA to it. And there's the structure of the integrase on the left showing it bound to double-stranded DNA. And the three prime end of the double-stranded DNA is in there, would be ready to be ligated to host DNA, except these integrase inhibitors, raltegravir, elvitegravir, dolutegravir, uh, who makes these names? They're unbelievable. They fit in the active site. That's the green molecule. That's dolutegravir fitting in right there. And they prevent the ligation of the viral DNA with the cellular DNA. So they're sitting right in the active site. And these were screened for this ability. People looked at libraries of compounds and got ones out and then made modifications of them. They, they, of course, also, when used singly, will give rise to resistance. And I think the last one is a inhibitor of the co-receptor, CCR5. Remember, HIV binding requires the viral glycoprotein to bind to CD4 and to CCR5. And so a molecule called Maraviroc was selected to be able to bind to CCR5. So CCR5 is a cellular chemokine receptor, which is a co-receptor. This drug fits in there. It's shown in green, fitting in to CCR5. Maraviroc is this molecule on the left. The effect is... Normally, GP120 binds CD4, and then that allows a high affinity binding with CCR5, which leads to fusion. When the drug is bound, when Maraviroc is bound to CCR5, it's shown here as the yellow sphere bound on CCR5. 
it disrupts the binding site, so you don't get high affinity binding and you don't get fusion. So the, the binding to CCR5 is essential for entry, and this small molecule essentially prevents binding and it prevents entry. So it's an entry inhibitor. There is also a fusion inhibitor, which uh, we haven't talked about, which targets the viral glycoprotein itself. All right, our question is, which of the following targets for HIV antivirals inhibits the earliest stage of infection? Nucleoside inhibitors, NNRTIs, CCR5 inhibitors, integrase inhibitors, or fusion inhibitors? Most of you got CCR5 inhibitors, right? That's blocking binding of GP120 to CCR5. Fusion inhibitors is after that. The fusion occurs after CCR5 binding. Now we use combination therapy to take care of HIV, and we can treat it as a chronic disease. As long as you take these drugs for your entire life, you can survive. We combine them. We first find out if you have virus that's resistant to any of the antivirals we have. We then tailor it so that you can uh, have activity in this one pill containing three different inhibitors. Here's the math of drug resistance. If you need one mutation for resistance, you have a mutation rate of one in 10,000 bases. That means in every 10,000 viruses, every base is substituted. Each person makes 10 to the 10th new virus particles a day. 10 to the 10th divided by 10 to the fourth. You're gonna make a million viruses each day with resistance to just one drug. That's why single drug therapy doesn't work. Two drugs, 10 to the four times 10 to the four is 10 to the eighth. You make 10 to the 10th viruses a day, so making 100 viruses a day resistant to two drugs. There are certain assumptions in this math, but it illustrates why three work. Three drugs, you need 10 to the 12th viruses needed for three mutations, and that's less likely to occur. Of course, the drugs in themselves suppress mutation when you first get them, so you're not actually making 10 to the 10th per day. So that's why triple therapy will work, unless you stop taking the drugs, of course. And this is a list of all of the HIV drugs that we have now, according to their function, nucleoside, reverse transcriptase inhibitors, chain terminators, non-nucleoside inhibitors that bind elsewhere, protease inhibitors, fusion inhibitors, which we didn't talk about, CCR5 entry inhibitors, integrase, and then these are the triple. This was the first triple combination pill, a tripla, and now we have uh, other combinations as well. As you can see, Complera and Stribild. We have three different triple combinations. These work, ARTs work. Here is the actual and projected numbers of people receiving ART, antiretroviral therapy, in these different WHO regions. You can see that it is increasing, mainly in the African region, which is where most of the HIV is currently, and it's going up, and that's where we need it, so that's great. And at the bottom is, is the lives saved. We have at the top the number of people dying of AIDS-related causes. So green is at the current coverage of ART, so we're going down with the number of deaths. This would be the, cover, the number of deaths without ART, so we've saved over four million deaths in this period from 2004 to 2012. And importantly, we're preventing 800,000 child infections. So we, we can give mothers just before birth a single dose of an antiviral, and that will reduce her viral loads so that at birth it is not transmitted in her blood to the baby because that's how it occurs, by blood contamination during birth. So we can decrease this and reduce the number of child infections. Of course, they will go on. If they're infected, they're infected for the rest of their lives. So this is really good to do this because it prolongs their lives, and also they don't pass it on to others as well. We also now do pre-exposure prophylaxis, which is really unusual. As I said earlier, you don't want to give antivirals to healthy people. Typically, it has been found to work well for people at risk who do not practice safe sex, for example, or cannot. It's a daily double therapy of two different drugs, which reduces the risk of transmission by over 90%. Sexual transmission reduces risk of intravenously 
transmitted virus by over 70%. And so far, there's been no resistance to this treatment. People wonder whether this is going to encourage resistance, but it happened, hadn't happened so far. But uh, we'll see. We'll have to keep monitoring this. But this is a way to prevent it in a, in a certain cohort of people. It is not a substitute for practicing safe sex, but unfortunately, some people uh, view it as that. Now, today, as I said, I think in the first lecture, we have 10 to the 16th genomes on the planet. And in those 10 to the 16th, we have resistance to every of those antivirals that I showed you and anything we'll ever make. So what we have to do is prevent infection. And as I said last time, vaccines haven't worked very well. So it's not clear what we're going to do. Next time, we're going to talk about how viruses evolve.